And our prayer today would be that it is well with your soul to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and uh, to trust Him in all things. Brother John's out of town today and somebody said, who's preaching? And here it is. So that was it. And uh, I'm glad you're here and we trust the Lord's going to bless you today. There are... <clears throat> Excuse me. There are a lot of events that have taken place in the last few weeks, in the last few months, that affect society. And we begin to look around at our world and the things that are going on and the things that we're allowing to take place in society has caused us to wonder how we can live faithful in a faithless generation. You may wonder why would I call this a faithless generation because it seems that the more things that happen in our society and in our world, the farther we are going from God. It does not seem that we are drawing nigh to God, but it seems that our society is turning away from God and from the truth of God's Word. In Isaiah, the 59th chapter, verses 1 through 4, the prophet Isaiah penned these words. And these words have the same effect on society today as it had then. They are as true today as they were then. The Word of God does not change. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God speaks the truth. I'll ask you to stand. We're going to read this passage. From the book of Isaiah, the 59th chapter, verses 1 through 4, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Notice verse 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands have defiled, or your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath uttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity. They speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. Father, I pray today that it would not be my words, but it would be yours. And I, Father, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts Encourage us, God, as we live our lives in the land in which we are living. And I pray, God, now that you'll just bless. If there are those here today who do not know Jesus, I pray that something that is said might draw them near unto you as you call them. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The society in which we live today there is a difference between what is called sentimental human spirituality and a, a genuine faith in Christ. That sentimental human spirituality you might think about is that you got a, you, you've got what we'll call a, a feel-good relationship. You're going to be that kind of individual who says, well, I feel good about my life. I'm living as good as I can, and I think I'll go to heaven. I think I'll go to the moon one of these days, but I doubt it. And a lot of folks who think they're going to heaven because they feel good about life, or even because they feel good about God, they're missing it. We've got a whole lot of people in our society today that have that spiritual context. And their spiritual life is, well, I just feel good. Everything's okay. I'm not worried about anything. My friend, if you don't have a right relationship with Jesus Christ, you've got a whole lot to worry about. It's just a fact. Now, I said that there is a, a great difference between spiritual, uh, about human spirituality and a, general, a genuine relationship with Jesus. I like what Paul said, and Paul made it, said it this way. He said, I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. It wasn't a spiritual feeling that he had. It was that he knew that he knew Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and there were no doubts. 
I feel sorry for folks who say, I hope I'm going to heaven. I feel sorry for folks who say, I think I'm going to heaven. But I praise God for individuals who can say, as Paul said, I know in whom I have believed. Now, that's what we're looking for, y'all. That's what's happening in this faithless generation that we're living in. We're not living in faith. We're living in what we think and how we feel. Some people want to talk about their spiritual journey. And I read a lot of things and it says that, well, I'm just on my, my journey and I'm exploring all the avenues that are out there. I read First John, the 14th chapter, the 6th verse, and it says that Jesus Christ said there are many avenues to heaven. Take one of them. Is that the one you all read? Did you all read the one that says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. See, that spiritual journey says, well, there, I could go this way and get to heaven. I can go this way and get to heaven. I can even go this way to get to heaven. There's, there's lots of ways, my friend. That's that faithless generation we're living in today. There is only one way. Maybe I'm dogmatic about it, and maybe some preachers are dogmatic about it, but I believe in our faithless generation. We've come to the place that men in pulpits have failed to tell folks that Jesus is the only way. We've wanted everybody to feel good about the journey of life. Y'all... Jesus said living the Christian life was going to be difficult. It's not going to be easy. And when you begin to stand for the things that are right, there'll be times in life that you'll stand alone. But God has called us to stand. I want to share some facts with you. I read this stuff and I thought, surely to goodness, this guy is off his rocker. But Gallup does lots of polls. Gallup and his people go back and they call and they search and they find for answers and they look for things. And I want to share with you a few things here that I hope disturb you just a little bit. It should. Gallup said this, that 20% of born-again Christians believe in reincarnation. Now, don't shoot that bird. That might be my aunt. Or don't step on that bug. I didn't live a real good life, but I came back as a caterpillar but I'm going to turn into a butterfly. 20%. Now, how in the world can you say, I'm a born-again Christian and think that I'm going to come back as something else? My friend, if the Bible's true and I believe it's true, it says this, that when we pass from this life unto the next life, we stay there because it is a place that is prepared for us, either heaven or hell. But you're going to be one place or the other for eternity doesn't say any place in there that you're coming back as something else. doesn't. But to think about that, 20% of people who call themselves born-again Christians believe in reincarnation. Another 26% believe in astrology. How many of you read your horoscope this morning before you came to church? Man, I'm proud of this group. There's some of them, if I'd asked that question, hands would have been up all over the place. Isn't it amazing in today's society, somebody's got to find it. And now with the Internet and everything, you can get your horoscope pretty quick. It'll come up and it'll tell you exactly what's going to happen to you today. Man, if I could believe that, I'd avoid a lot of problems, wouldn't you? If you knew everything's going to happen to you the rest of the day, you'd have it made. But you know what? We're not even guaranteed the next second, are we? We're not. I was pastoring church in Louisville, Kentucky, and if I've told you this story before, you'd just take a nap right now. But I uh, had a guy. He was a Sunday school teacher. And he came and he taught his Sunday school class that morning. He was all set. I, sh I shook hands with him, asked him what he was doing. He said, I'm just excited about being in church. I had a great Sunday school class, and I'm looking forward to the morning worship service. He was ready for service. And he was sitting on the back row had a massive heart attack and died. So he had Sunday school in Louisville, Kentucky. He had worship service in heaven. See, you don't know what's going to happen. But we think that if we can just look at the stars and somebody can tell us this is what's going to happen to you because all the stars lined up, 
Isn't it a sad, sad thing in society that 26 people who call themselves born-again Christians believe in astrology? And then I really like this, and I want you all to know this next one. There's people in our town who actually believe this. Okay? There are now. I don't want you to think I'm being cruel, not stepping on anybody's toes, but I want you to know there's folks in town that actually believe this because this percentage is so high. Look at this one. It says that 45% of those who classify themselves as born-again Christians or born-again believe that people are good enough that they can earn a place in heaven. Now, I get to do lots of funerals. I really do. And it seems so odd to me that everybody that dies is going to heaven. Y'all, let me assure you this. That ain't true. The only ones that are going to heaven are those that are actually born again, not those that are doing good things. The Bible doesn't say that we are saved by our good works. The Bible says that we are saved by our faith in Jesus Christ. It's not what we do. Man, all my good and whatever good I would do, according to the Scripture, and Isaiah said this is as filthy rags. It means absolutely nothing. So when you got 46% of the people in society today that may be born-again Christians and somebody dies, they say, you know, I imagine they went to heaven because they didn't do anything wrong. My friend, if you've never accepted Christ your personal Savior, that's the worst thing you'll ever do in your life. You can do everything else right. But if you don't accept Jesus, it's all for nothing. Absolutely for nothing. Well... Tried to read a little bit more because that got me kind of upset and thinking. And then another guy writes this. And I really wondered about this guy because this guy is a part of the University of California at Berkeley. Now, if any of y'all go back and think about the 60s, some of y'all don't even remember the 60s, but you're laughing out there. I know that you know what Berkeley was in the 60s. Anyway, this guy was from Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, and he writes about religious things. Now, I don't know how born again he is and I don't know how religious he is but he wrote a book and, and the book says spiritual marketplace and in the spiritual marketplace he made this comment and most of you will know that baby boomers are my age and some of y'all's age that means you were born someplace between 19 I think 46 and 19 what 70 something gets a whole lot of y'all that are in here with us but here's what he said. Wade Clark, his name Wade Clark Roof, in Spiritual Marketplace wrote that half of born-again baby boomers believe all religions are equally good and true. Almost half, though, have no involvement in a conservative Protestant church. Now, does that say something to you there? Half of them say that there's, how did he write this? I'm trying to remember. Half of them think that all religions are equally good. So if all religions are equally good, then these folks that are Muslims in, who want to cut off Christians' heads, they're okay. It's okay. Hindus that are going to say everybody's going to be happy. Are all of y'all happy all the time? I thought that was the right answer. But see, here's our problem. We got a lot of folks in society today that are believing the wrong thing. And my friend, when we believe the wrong thing, it leads to the society in which we are living today. When you get away from the truth of God's Word, you will reap what you sow according to the Word of God. That's it. So we're asking ourselves, how can we live a faithful life if we're living in an unfaithful society? I would ask this question, make you think for just a moment. Is it any wonder that America is in the shape that she's in today? Because we are living in that faithless generation. So as I pondered that thought, this passage says some things to me, and it gave me some answers. And as it gave me some answers, I want to share those with you. How can I be faithful in this faithless generation? First, you've got to understand the problem. Is that Okay. You can't overcome any problem until you understand what the problem is. I, I, I love to read ads, and I was reading one the other day because I was looking for something. 
And uh, the old boy said he had a car for sale. And I thought, man, that car's awful cheap. And uh, he down there in the fine print toward the end, he said it does have a problem or two. I understood then why it was cheap. He said, I've not been able to fix it. That helped me a whole lot too, meant that he had been trying to find and there is no answer to it. But he said, I'm convinced that it's probably just the key. Now, you know what? If it were just the key, what would you have done? You had to change the key and start the car and it wouldn't be for sale. It's got a problem. So here's our thing in America and here's our thing in the church today. We've got to understand what the problem is if we're ever going to solve the problem. Well, let's look at what the, the Bible says. And this is right out of Isaiah, the 59th chapter, verses 1 through 4. And here's what the Word of God said. It says, Our iniquities have separated us from God. The Bible says that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Y'all believe that? That means that's all of us. We're the same way, okay? Now, here's the other thing I want you to understand. God is not the God who likes to look down upon our sin. God is not pleased with us when we sin. God does not enjoy sin. When God looked upon the sin of the, the children of Israel, I'll say this, He turned His eyes from them. There were times that God says, I have forsaken you because of your iniquity. Your iniquities have separated us. Well, there was this man named Jesus. Y'all remember him? This man named Jesus was hung upon a cross one day. And according to the scripture, Jesus, being the just, bore all the sins or the iniquities of us being the unjust that we could be brought to God. Now here's what Jesus, as he hung upon the cross, his arms stretched out, he had, thor or he had a crown of thorns upon his head, he had nails in his hands and his feet, he's looking out at a crowd who cried out, crucify him, and you know what he says? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Father could not look upon the sin, and he turned his back upon his Son. As the Son, Jesus Christ, hung on the cross, not for his sins, but for yours and mine. Now, y'all, you got to think about this. Why are we crying out? Why isn't God blessing America today? Because our sins have separated us from God. You say, oh, now, preacher, you're being kind of tough. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. It's not me. It just says it right there. But your iniquities have separated you from God. Understand the problem. The second part of the problem is that our sins have caused God to hide his face from us. Did you notice how that passage says this in verse 2 and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear a holy God cannot and will not look upon sin a holy God hurts when we sin a holy God experiences pain with, when we sin can you imagine the pain that God is going through right now because of our world? Think about that. Then, if you want to just bring it a little bit closer, think about the pain and hurt that our God is going through right now because of America. And think about the pain and the hurt that our God is going through right now because of things in Arkansas. You know, I can get on a political soapbox if you want me to. The elections have passed, but we, we're allowing gambling in our state, and for years we didn't. We allow so many things to creep in, and we think, oh, it's not going to hurt right now. But you know what it's done? It's caused God to hide his face from our land. It was Jesus. And you remember that Jesus was in Jerusalem at one time, and, and even as he went up, and, and, and I was able to go to Jerusalem one time, and on the other side of the Kidron Valley, you're over on the side by Bethany. But as you look across, you can see the Eastern Gate. You see the city of Jerusalem over there. You look through the, the, 
the Mount of Olives, if you will, the, the path that, that Jesus trod. But as Jesus is there one time, he's looking out across Jerusalem. You'll find this, I believe, in Matthew, the 23rd, verses 36 through 38. But if Jesus said this, and he's looking down at Jerusalem, and I'm wondering today if he's not looking down at America and almost saying the same thing. But here's what he said. He said, Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how oft would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wing, and you would not. Behold, your house is left desolate. Does that not speak to America today? Our house is left desolate. What are we going to do? Oh, preacher, it'll get better. Things are going to change. Yes, they are. Praise God, he's coming back one of these days. But when he comes back, I want you to remember this. Not everybody's going to be ready to go. Not everybody. Somebody's going to say, well, now, preacher, you remember, so-and-so wasn't all that bad. I, I think they believed in God. Bless their hearts. So does the devil. But is the devil going to heaven? Don't think so. Because the Bible says that God has prepared a place for Satan and for those that follow him. And Jesus, looking at Jerusalem, maybe he's looking at America today, and he says, your house is left desolate. My friend, it's time we understood the problem. One other thing I share with you about the problem it's not what I say. It's exactly what the Word of God says. I want you to look at this. Verse 3 says, Your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Whew! Is he not talking about us today? Man, think about this, my friend. We're living in that time. And, and if I'm on my soap box, I'll get off of it for just a minute. But this thing that happened in New York in the past two weeks where you can have an abortion right up to the time of birth. And then in Virginia, thank the Lord, they got that one defeated. But even after a child is born, destroy it. Y'all, if we're doing that to babies, those of you who are over 60, think about what could happen to you. When we get to the spot in life that you get to the place that you're not worth anything, you don't have anything, you can't do anything, we live in a faithless generation, a faithless society. It says, get rid of them. Well, let me share with you what the Word of God says in Proverbs, the sixth chapter, verses 16 through 19. The Word of God says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a, lie, a, a proud look, a lying tongue, this next one, and hands that shed innocent blood. Catch that. Isaiah said it. The wise man Solomon said it. Hands that shed innocent blood. These are an abomination unto the Lord. Notice the other things he said. A heart that devises wicked imagination. No, oh, we're living in a time right now when Everybody's thinking of all the things they can do wrong instead of the things they can do right. We are. Look at the things that, that are on our televisions and the stuff you can hear on your radio. Some of these songs, thank the Lord, I can't hear good because I can't understand the words. But some of these words are terrible, y'all. Well, let me get off that. It says that feet that are swift to running to mischief, we're living that. A false witness that speaks lies, and then those that sow discord. Don't. That is, according to the Word of God, that's the generation we're living in. This is real stuff. Somebody can say, now listen, preacher, they wrote that, Isaiah wrote that years and years ago. But if, excuse me, if God inspired him to write it years and years ago, and the Bible is the inspired, infallible Word of God, then that truth that was then is true today. 
Now, here's what we're at in society. We've got to understand that we, if we are a faithful generation, how are we going to live in this faithless generation? What is it that we're going to have to do? Well, God tells us. Isaiah gave it to us. It's not, a, it's not that difficult to understand what God says. So much of the time, <coughs> excuse me, we want to read the Bible and we want to read the stuff that we like. Is that okay? I like that. There's certain things in there. We, we were reading something one day, and Kelly was doing devotion for us, and uh, she said, read this so-and-so passage. And I said, I can't. And she said, why not? And I said, that's one of those pages I didn't like, and I took it out. I didn't, but anyway, hope you understand what I'm saying. See, that's how we do today. We really do. But here's what God said, and God gave us some things. These are important things. And actually, Isaiah started off by telling us in the very beginning, God can take care of the problems that I'm going to tell you about. Notice what he says, verse 1. It's an important verse. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. He said, God can and God will when God's people get right. But you notice that next one said, it's not happening right now because he can't hear you because of all the sin that's in the land. That's the reason we're in such a shape today, y'all, is that instead of doing the things that God has told us to do, we're doing the things that Satan leads us to do. And you say, well, but wait a minute, preacher, we're not doing that. Y'all, when we allow godless people to lead us in a godless manner, we're following. That's a problem. That's a problem. Now, we as preachers... If we just stand up here and say, you know, we've elected leaders and they're doing the best they can, y'all, somewhere along the line, we've messed up. Yeah, we as preachers, the Word of God is true. And we've got to proclaim the Word of God is true. And when we do, then here's the things that we'll learn. God's hand is not shortened. God's hand is strong. God has the power to change our land. And it'll change when God's people call upon Him. It was in Chronicles that said, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, then will I hear. You see what the condition is? See, that's our problem today. God bless us, but don't get on to us for what we're doing. When I was growing up, I had parents that loved me. They loved me so much that my mother allowed me to pick my own switch. Oh, that was a loving woman. And she always told me to go out there and get it off the peach tree. I killed that peach tree. Because every time you go out there and get one of them, it's one limb less. But she loved me. And I had it applied to me, her love in a certain part of my anatomy. But I want you all to know, if mother hadn't loved me, if she'd said, son, just do whatever you want to, just don't get caught, think what would happen. There were lots of things that I did that I think mother and dad never knew about because it was away from them. But for some strange reason, y'all, by the time I got home, they knew about it. They did. Now, here's the thing that we're living in society today. We think God's not looking at us today. God's not going to see me do what I'm doing wrong. God's eyes are upon all of us. God sees what we're doing. God knows what we're doing. We've got to make some changes. Notice how he did this. God's hand is not shortened that he cannot say, God will, God will pick us up. God will take care of us when we're willing to trust him and obey him. But trust and obedience to God, y'all, begins with two things. Confession and repentance. Whoa, wait a minute, preacher. Confession means I have to tell God that I've messed up. No, we have to say it this way. God, I've sinned. Isn't it a marvelous thing when you read about the prodigal son coming back to his dad? You know, he said, Dad, I sinned. I squandered everything you gave me. We come before the Father and say, Father, I've sinned. I messed up everything you gave me. But I come to you now, and I want to repent. I want to turn from my wicked ways. I want to turn to you. I want to do those things that please you. See, confession and repentance leads to forgiveness from the Father. That's when he's willing to reach down and pick us up. 
We're wondering why he hadn't reached down yet. It's probably because we haven't confessed. We certainly have not turned from our wicked ways. But David said this. David said this in Psalms 42, 40 verse 2. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a a solid rock, making my footsteps sure or firm. My friend, it's like this. When we are willing to confess and repent, God's willing to pick us up and set us on a solid foundation and begin to build us. God's calling for America to repent, to confess, and he'll pick us up. Second thing that he did about this, understand this, God can hear. God hears the cry of the righteous. And remember this, our righteousness does not come like they said, I'm good, I'm doing everything right. According to the scripture, we are made righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. There is no other righteousness. He is our righteousness. Has absolutely nothing to do with us other than the fact that we're willing to accept him and what he did for us. Isn't that a marvelous thought? I'm not made righteous by me. I'm made righteous by him. It's by him that I am made righteous. We're saved by faith and that not of ourselves. When we understand this, God will incline his ear. He will hear our cry and he will respond. Notice what he says this, that God can save. God will save. God can save our land. God has the power to make all things new. God has the power to change our society. And God can save America. God can save every individual in America. According to the word of God, and you'll find this, I believe, in Second Peter, the third chapter and the ninth verse. God will hear our cry. God will hear our prayer because this is one fact that's true. It's never failed. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men would count slack. But he is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Did you catch that? God wants to save. God wants to save America. God wants to save you. You're here today without Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. My friend, I want you to understand this. God wants to save you. If you're sitting here and saying, well, now you understand, preacher, I, I'm doing pretty good. Ain't worth a hill of beans. If you're sitting here and saying, Preacher, you don't understand all the things that I've ever done in my life. God couldn't save somebody like me. God saved me. He can save you. See, that's the thing about it. He's not slack concerning his promise. He's long-suffering. He waits because you know what he wants to do? He wants to save us. He wants to bring us out of the pit. He wants to put us on a solid rock. He wants to do for us the things we can't do for ourselves. You can, we can, live a faithful life in an unfaithful generation. But we've got to make the commitment to live the faithful life. See, you've got to come from unfaithfulness to faithfulness. It's a complete turnaround. See, for our nation to change, our nation's got to make the complete turnaround. For us as individuals to change, we've got to make the complete turnaround. The scripture would tell us this, that behold, all things become new. The old things are passed away. The unfaithful is going to get rid of it. Behold, all things become new. How are we going to do this? We'll study the word of God. Somebody say, well, preacher, I I just can't understand the word of God. You know why you you can't understand? Because you don't get into it. You've got to begin reading it and saying, God, open my mind to what this verse means. When it says, Love your neighbor whole sometimes. God, I don't even like them. Now you tell me I gotta love them. Let let him show you how he can. See, we study, we pray, and we seek the power of God in our lives. The reason some of us are so powerless in life, y'all, we don't talk to God enough. Think about that. Well, preacher, I pray when things get bad. Pray when they get good too. See, when we pray, when we seek God. We find his power. We've got to be what God wants us to be. 
See the screen, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 15 and verse, this is steadfastness. This is where we are faithful. Be steadfast and moving, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Did you get that last line? When you're doing it for the Lord, it's not in vain. God said, I'll be with you. I'll not forsake you. I'll not leave you. But guess what, y'all? The choice, the decision, yours. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. We're going to bow our heads. We're going to pray. We have an invitation to him. I want you to do what God wants you to do. If you're here without Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, be the best time you'll ever have to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Come and say, God, I've messed up. I, I confess my sins. I want to turn from my sins. I accept you as my personal Savior. Let him come into your life. If you're here and you've just had some difficult times, say, I hadn't been as faithful I ought to be, maybe just come to an altar of prayer and pray. Whatever your need is, y'all, do what God wants you to do. Father, I pray now that you will speak to the hearts of every individual here. I don't know everybody's needs, God. I know that there are times in my life that I know I'm not as faithful as I need to be, and I confess it. But, God, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that, God, we be the body that begins to turn our nation we be the body that begins to turn our state. We be the body that begins to turn our community. That God, we live faithful in a faithless generation. I pray in Jesus' name.